Hi, everyone. I am Mark Gordon, uh, Managing Editor of the Business Observer. Thank you for joining us for the Business Observer's Open Book Club, Open Book Book Club. Um, before we get started, hey, Heather Kasten just joined us. Hi, Heather. Um, wanted to just announce some of the Business Observer and Observer Media Group people on the call. We have Kat Hughes, who's been letting people in. Kat Hughes, the Executive Editor of the Business Observer. And we have Diane Schaefer, she is Diane, associate publisher, um, and possibly Emily Walsh, our publisher of the Observer Media Group, but I'm not sure she's logged on yet. Um, okay, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, books about leadership and business are important to many of us. So with this book club, we're exploring some of the best books about businesses and leadership through discussions led by top area business people and community members. Today's book, I have it right here, Worldwide Bestseller, Atomic Habits, An Easy and Proven Way to Build Good Habits and Break Bad Ones by James Clear. Our discussion leader for today's book club gathering is Ben Jones, Benjamin Jones with Allegiant private advisors, um, and we'll introduce him more in a minute. Uh, quick housekeeping note, as Kat mentioned, um, if you can mute yourself, if you're not already muted, that'd be great. Uh, if you have a comment or a question during discussion, you can unmute, just raise your hand, Ben or I or Kat or somebody will bring you part of the discussion. And if your name is showing up on Zoom as Robin Langton, our marketing director, um, you can feel free to please change it into your own name. You just gotta click on that blue box up top, the three buttons and rename. A um, Couple other housekeeping things. We have more book clubs, open books coming up. Wednesday, June 2nd, Wednesday, September 1st, Wednesday, November 3rd, they are all four to 5 p.m. And um, we hope to see you there for those. As far as our sponsors, we wanna thank our three generous sponsors for the book club. One is coming up, here we go. Okay, they're all on the same. Uh, Kirkering Barbarios, Sarasota's premier CPA firm, providing a variety of tax, audit, and accounting services to businesses and individuals. Williams Parker Attorneys at Law, committed to client service to community and devotion to excellence in the practice of law, guiding principles for nearly 100 years, and the Sarasota Chamber, a bridge that links businesses, organizations, and residents with innovative programs that strengthen Sarasota's economic vitality and quality of life. So thank you to all our wonderful and awesome sponsors. And before we get over to Ben, just a little bit more on, on Ben. He is Principal, President, and Chief Investment Officer of Allegiant Private Advisors manages assets for individuals, families, and charitable organizations. He's also responsible for establishing Allegiance overall investment strategy, security selection, and portfolio management. And three, I think, pretty awesome, cool, fun facts about Ben. One, he was a business observer, 40 under 40 honoree in 2009. So we don't know how old you were in 2009, Ben, but start doing the math on that. Um, two is I discovered, I've known Ben for several years, um, from writing about him and, and knowing him in the community, discovered recently he's a big baseball fan. He's got like all kinds of baseball memorabilia. So hit him up for conversations about that if you want at some point. And three, I think you can learn a lot about somebody when this is pre pandemic, when you are, um, at your child, your children's school, waiting for them to come at the sort of pickup area. And Ben and I, our kids went to the same elementary school and we always used to be there around 5.30 at pickup time. And I always see Ben's kids running, daddy, daddy. So it was always kind of fun uh, to see Ben in that light. Um, so that's my three facts on Ben. Thank you again, Ben, for being here. Take it away, Atomic Habits. Yeah, and I think I was probably the one that was rushing to get there before they actually closed down the school, right? We were, we were both the same thing. You don't want your kid to be like that one that like the last one. I get it. I, I've been there. That's right. <laughs> and Mark, last time we talked, uh, you were asking about a baseball I had. It, I've got here, this is Tim Wakefield signed baseball that one of my colleagues here at Allegiant gave me. Um, 
I I can't thank the Business Observer enough for, for putting this together. I think this is a tremendous thing to do. Um, I consider myself a lifelong learner. Um, as much as I can find time to, to do it, that's what I love to do. So um, I appreciate being asked to host this. I, I, I'm certainly no expert in this area, um, but since I do consider myself a lifelong learner, I will try to lead this group and, and hopefully we can have a, a good conversation. Um, I will not preach. Um, and I hope that this is a, a really good dialogue. Um, so hopefully everyone's being interactive and I don't wanna have to call people out, but I will if I have to. So just remember, try to speak up. So if everyone's on mute now, just remember that um, you can take yourself off mute and, and ask questions, give your own opinions on it. Most importantly, talk about your experiences with this and how you've learned and grown and, and hopefully some of the successes that you've had and, and maybe even the failures. I think we can all learn from some of the failures as well. Um, so let's make this interactive. The, the first question that I would have, and I'll go, I'll go old school on this, um, which is just a raise of your physical hand. How many people have read Atomic Habits? Okay, so I'll, I'll, say, I'll say half. Um, and there's no pre-requirement that you read the book um, to be part of this conversation. So um, I, everyone I think can still be involved because there's, there's lessons here that um, apply to everyone in, in life. Um, the, the next question is how many people have actually participated in, in these open book clubs in the past? Raise of hands. Okay, even more. So you know how these go, right? Let, let's keep this fun, let's keep it lively. Um, and you know, when I started to think about this, the, the question that first came to me is, you know, why Atomic Habits? Why should we be discussing a book like this? The, the first thing that came to mind is, look, we're, I used to say we're in the middle of a pandemic. I hope we're not in the middle anymore, but we are in a pandemic. And what that meant was about a year ago, every single routine that we had was disrupted, right? We, we had our normal day, our normal routine, and that got thrown out the window. And uh, some people bounced back really quickly, got back into the routines and others, not so much. And, and we're still trying to figure that out. So I think this is very timely to talk about routines, habits, and, and really we have the opportunity right now to set ourselves up for success. It's the perfect time for it. Um, and also, you know, I was listening in on a lot of these other book club discussions and it's a very similar theme. A lot of the discussions have revolved around a conversation like this. And in particular, and I think at least one of them, Atomic Habits was actually brought up by one of the participants as, as a book to, to read and to follow. So um, I, I think it's spot on with the conversation that we've had in the past here. Um, so I'm looking forward to some lively conversation. And the last thing that I would say um, is, and this is probably where my nerdy geeky side comes out a little bit, but the thing that stuck with me, you know, I, I'm an investment manager, right? So I love compound interest. I, I love the math behind it. I love how it works. And in the book, when he talks about, um, you know, habits are, are really the compound interest of self-improvement, and that just stuck with me, right? It's, it's so hard to, to have these habits and to improve and to um, become really good at something, but eventually it starts to build on, on itself and it becomes something incredibly powerful. Uh, so to me, that was, you know, that was really the reason behind this book. And I hope everyone that has read it has enjoyed it. And I hope everyone else by the end of this conversation will want to go read it. Um, so let's start off another question for the crowd. And this, it doesn't matter if you read the book or not, but how many people have at some point in their past had a New Year's resolution? 
Yeah, I think almost, almost all of us at, at some point have had a New Year's resolution. And for everyone, uh, everyone that raised their hand, keep your hand up. And now keep your hand up if you felt like you were successful at your New Year's resolution. Yeah, a lot, lot less of us, <laughs> right? And, and there's a reason for that, right? We have these big ideas in our head of what we want to do. And it's really hard to stick with it. It's really hard to come up with a plan. Um, and, and it becomes something where we just don't have the habits to, to actually make it stick. And that to me is something important because we all wanna succeed in, in our goals and we have to think about the, the things that will make us successful in doing that. So I, I, I throw this out there as, as a way to maybe start the conversation here. If anyone wants to be a brave soul and talk about one of their New Year's resolutions that they've had in the past, um, let, let's say one that wasn't successful. Does anyone wanna throw out an example of something that they thought I'm gonna be able to do this year and maybe it didn't work out so well. Oh, everyone's scared. Okay, I'll start. Um, so every year there's always a weight loss goal on the New Year's resolutions <laughs> without fail. Um, and so I feel like I have a decent plan to meet that goal of working out and watching what I eat and all those things, but it never quite succeeds the whole year round. It, like progress will be made, but sustaining it is the hardest thing, so. Thank you, Kat, brave, brave soul. <laughs> and I will say this, I'm pretty sure every single person on this call has had a New Year's resolution that's somehow tied to their weight. <laughs> but one way or the other. So I think we've all been there. And, you know, I think it's important because we, we always come up with, with um, goals like that. And one of the things that I learned in going through this was that, you know, there's a difference between setting a goal, which is really the direction that you're trying to go and the system that you're going to use to get there. So a lot of times we talk about, okay, I. I want to lose weight, or I want to go to the gym more often, or I want to get my finances under control. I want to save more, but that's not, it's not direct enough. It doesn't really give us a system for how we're going to do it. And so that's one of the, the tools that he, he talks about that, you know, we, we need to have those systems. Um, but really what it starts with is your identity and having an identity that is you know, instead of I, I want to lose weight, it's I want to be a healthy person. You know, I, I associate my identity with being a healthy person and starting there and then trying to figure out, you know, how do you actually achieve that? How do you how do you become that? And there's there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, and I was actually reminded of this. You know, he, he kind of flips it. There's actually a diagram that he uses. Um, you know, talking about, and I'll actually, I will share my screen here. Um, the three layers of behavior change, right? And really talking about the identity as, as being the core of it. And then you can talk about the processes and then you can talk about the outcomes, which would be losing the weight. And, um, you know, how it should, again, start in the middle and go out. And as I was going through this and, and thinking about it, it, it brought back something that came up in um, one of the earlier um, book club conversations about start with why. And if you remember in that, there, there was the golden circle and the, the why was in the middle. And it's that different approach of you have to start there and then, and then move out. And, and that's when you become successful. And so there's a lot of similarities here um, that, that I was reminded of as I started to, to go through this. So it all starts there. And the, um, he breaks it down into kind of these four different laws. So I thought we could take some time to talk about 
the four different laws and, and really trying to break down how you create these habits. Um, so the four laws, just as a reminder and for people that haven't read, the first law is a cue, you know, make it obvious. Make it obvious that um, the, the habit is there and it's something that you're going to do. The second law is craving, make it attractive, right? We don't wanna do things that are, are not attractive. Um, the third law, which is the response, make it easy, right? If we know we're gonna do this, we need to try to set ourselves up for success versus all these roadblocks in the way. Um, and the fourth law is the reward, make it satisfying. Once you get through it, you want to feel good about it so that you do it again. Um, so if we wanted to break this down and, and let's start at the first one, the first law, which is the Q, you know, make it all obvious. I, I'd love to hear from people on, you know, if you've tried to implement some of these strategies, if you've tried to use um, his, his process to create a habit, what have you done, you know, give an example of, of the habit that you're trying to, to create and how have you tried to make it obvious so that it was something that you just, it was in front of you all the time and you did it uh, every day or every week or however often you wanted to do it. So I'll open it up to, to any brave soul who wants to talk about um, any habits they've tried to create. Hey, Ben, this is Rhonda Liebrick over here. Um, so I've been studying for some advanced credentials, if you will. And the goal has been, you know, twice a week, an hour a day. Well, that doesn't happen. So I was inspired by just put the book next to you and maybe look at it in one minute at a time. So um, I've implemented that instead of having the book over there on the shelf and I'll pick it up, you know, at lunchtime and then never get to it. So let's keep that book on the desk and at least touch it once a minute or once a day, you know, for a minute and then build on that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a tremendous way to just make it a little bit easier. And uh, it's amazing how little things like that are really the things that make us fail, right? We look for any excuse that we possibly can to not do something that, that we think we should. And so a little step like that, uh, it is just eliminating a roadblock. Anyone else have any things that they've worked on? I'll share some similarities just to follow up on cats. Of course, we've all had some resolution about um, whatever weight loss goals or workout goals at the start of the year. But I think something that was profound in terms of identifying and, and labeling all of these habits and labeling the process was a resolution before for me would be to start running again versus I used to be a runner. And so I would like to identify again as a runner. It's been a long time, but like, I think that was really profound for me to look at it with a different lens. And then similar to Rhonda with her book, actually putting your shoes, even if I'm starting with walking again, um, but putting the shoes in a convenient spot where a really it's, I feel like it's already a, six, a step in the right direction and a positive habit to just put the shoes there, like that they have a better, more purposeful place that's already kind of jump starting that process and then making it attractive by having an accountability partner because I want it to be a social event for myself as well. So kind of starting to layer on some of those key concepts with the, the making it at least uh, very obvious and attractive with a, with a cohort. Let me ask you, Jamie, are you, are you setting, um, are you setting kind of goals or, or rules on it that, you know, I'm going to do this before I do something. So you're tying it to um, an event so that it's not at some point I'm going to make sure that I do this today, but you know, you tie it to something that you're already doing. I'm working on those tiny changes, but I am trying to establish that I really, the habit stacking, I feel like in my evening routine has led me to like a more mindful, peaceful state versus the constant triage that you do at the end of the day or at the end of the night. Sometimes I feel like I've been trying to implement kind of that idea of habit stacking where you build upon that routine um, 
and I hope to get there okay then with the running. <laughs> I'll, I'll report back. That's great. How about anyone else? I, um, I did a program over the course of 108 days where it required you to do a number of tasks. And the biggest thing that I realized about halfway through were all the little excuses to your point, Ben, that you make not to do things like be, oh, it's a little cold outside, so I won't go outside and do my walk or something, right? Or, oh, like 10 pages, I can read that tomorrow. And you make these little excuses, could be in your business or life. And I just started seeing all the little things that, wow, I keep making these little white lie excuses almost. And then they build up over time to compound against you versus compounding for you. So um, I forgot who said they were reading, but I started reading 10 pages a day, just 10 pages. But I read through tons of books. And I hadn't read books in years. So it was nice. Yeah, I, I think that's a, a great point. Um, you know, it, it's all it comes down to is just starting, right? Just just start a little bit and try to eliminate the excuses. And, and there is something that I don't think it was in the book, but as I started looking around a little bit further, he, he put some ideas out there about um, essentially before you even get started, be honest with yourself and say, how am I going to fail, right? If this is what I'm trying to do, what are the excuses that I'm gonna come up with along the way that I know are gonna be roadblocks for me? And actually pre-plan it and be, you know, some of it's communication, right? If, if you know an issue is going to be um, a, a timing issue with someone you're, you work with, or it's at home, you know you need to put the time aside to do something, but you need to communicate with your spouse about it so that they pick your kids up from school that day because you know that's what you need to do. Um, you know, working through those things beforehand and trying to come up with a solution be to it before you even let it be an excuse. Um, I thought that was a really good concept because we know we're going to come up with those excuses. <laughs> we know we are. And if we think about it beforehand and try to pre-plan for it, I, I hope that that kind of takes some of those failures out of the system and, and really helps set us up for success. Anyone else have any thoughts they wanted to share on the, the first law? Yeah, and maybe not so much. This is Ryan Adamson. Um, and in full disclosure, I read this about two years ago, so I may be paraphrasing some of the concepts and maybe even merging them with other books I've read along the way. Um, but Jamie was kind enough to invite me, so I figured I'd throw in my two cents. But I think taking it down to, like with the habit tracker, maybe I'm jumping topics here a little bit, you don't have to bite off the entire thing at once. So if you look at the workout topic, maybe you just take 15 minutes a day and that's enough where you don't get the full hour and you're not going to put it off another day. You say, all right, maybe in 15 or 10 minutes, I can go do 10 setups or, or what have you. Really looking at it, you know, on a, a smaller level, realizing, you know, those things stack up and it's no longer this, this massive undertaking where you're going to lose 30 pounds. No, you're just deciding I'm going to at least put 10 minutes in a day and at one, you know, 1% clip a day, you're going to slowly chip away at that. Yeah, the, you know, those, going back to kind of how I kicked it off with the, the compounding of returns here, um, that, you know, 1% improvement, and, and for those that haven't, haven't read the book, he, he talks a lot about this, you know, just small incremental improvements, and it may seem really small, uh, it may not seem like you're, you're making any huge uh, improvements, but over time it starts to build, and, you know, you think of compound interest, right? It, in the first few years, it probably doesn't, doesn't even matter. But 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road, it is phenomenal. And that, that's exactly what happens with these 1% improvements um, that we can do in our habits. You can start small, right? So if you want to read, yeah, read 10 pages and then read 11 pages and then you know, 12 pages. Um, if you want to work out, there was um, something that I saw going around, I think, earlier in the pandemic, which was the push-up challenge, 
right? We, we, we talk about how uh, we want to be fit. We want to get in shape. And so what do we do? The first thing we do is we try to do as many push-ups as we can. And guess what? We don't stick with it. And so the push-up challenge, the whole idea behind it was here's 30 days and every day I'm going to make an improvement. So the first day, all you do is one push-up. Can you just do one? The second day you do two. The third day you do three. By the end of it, you, you're up to 30. And you can do any increments that you want, but it's something that you can bite off. It's something that you can make a habit. Um, because it, it's much easier to stick with that way. Um, and it's something that you can improve on so that before you know it, you're doing 100 push-ups. Um, and, and it's something that, again, you, it's, it's your identity. It's not that you start off as this amazing person, person doing push-ups, but your identity is I'm a person that does push-ups every day. It doesn't matter how many you do. <laughs> But now your identity is the person that does push-ups every day. And that is incredibly powerful. Um, so I, to me, that I, I agree. I think that's a great point. To me, that was one of the most powerful things that, that I saw here, that this stuff adds on top of each other and, and really becomes powerful. Um, I, I guess now I'll, I'll switch to, to the second law which is a craving, you know, how do we make this attractive? Because most of the time when we're trying to have a habit here, we know it's not something that we really want to do. Otherwise we'd be doing it. Um, so if we're trying to come up with a way to get into a new habit and to make it attractive, um, what, what have you all done in, you know, with a certain habit and how you've tried to to um, make it something that you actually want to do. And just so everyone knows, I'm completely okay with awkward silences. <laughs> so <laughs> we, could, we could sit here until people speak up. I can share. Um, I've been trying to walk more during the day, just take a couple of quick breaks and um, give my mind a break and get my body moving for a few minutes. And um, sometimes it's hard to break the momentum when I'm in the middle of work, but um, I listen to audiobooks a lot. And so if I have a good audiobook going um, that I'm really into, it sort of motivates me to um, get out there and take a walk and listen to my audiobook while I'm walking. And so that's just a little bit extra incentive to do what I should be doing, but while I'm just giving myself an extra layer of enjoyment while I'm doing it. That's great. Yeah, and that's that's what he, he talks about as the temptation um, uh, bundling. You know, you, you do you pair a task that you know you need to do with or you should do with something that you already do. So if you know, okay, I I need to take a walk, I need to take a run, okay, I'm gonna use that as my time to to catch up on a podcast or listen to a book or something that uh, Call it a guilty pleasure, you know, whatever it is for you. But that it, it ties it together so that you know, if I'm going to do this, I have to do this as well. Along those same lines, I think that especially with the pandemic, it really accelerated this notion that we are like maximizing every moment. And so you no longer have downtime on the way to work or maybe most people or some people do now, but you don't have the commute, you have fewer lunch meetings and that that nonsense time that was also a decompression time or a time to catch up with a personal call or a personal errand or something. And so I've been trying to, same thing, kind of take a quick midday stroll, but I just bother someone, a friend via text and say, or try to catch them on the phone um, to do a quick walk and talk. And it could be for 10 minutes, but it's a nice catch up and um, a little pick me up midday that gets you out of your normal routine and kind of blood flowing and like a mental health break to midday because I can only handle baby steps. So I'm a big fan of this concept overall. <laughs> That's great. What else? All 
I, I'll tell you something that I've toyed with that I've, I've been on and off with it, but you know, it, it's part of my morning uh, ritual. I, I'm a huge coffee lover. I, I really enjoy my cup of coffee in the morning and I've tried to, you know, stack it with something else so that uh, if I'm gonna have a cup of coffee, guess what? I should probably get on the Peloton before I, I have that cup of coffee. That's my reward for, for doing it. Um, so it doesn't even have to be that you're doing it together. It could be that, you know, once I, I do this, I'm going to allow myself to, to have this. All right, how about moving on to the third law, which is response, um, right? If we try to make it obvious, it's right in front of us. If we try to make it attractive so that it's something that hopefully we want to do a little bit more than if it was by itself, um, the response then needs to be easy, right? Those are the things that drive us to it. And now it becomes okay, we need to take action, we actually need to, to do it. Um, so that's where I think it goes into um, making it easy. There was already some, some comments earlier about, uh, you know, if you're going to go to the gym um, or read a book, have the book out. If you're gonna go to the gym, have your gym clothes out ready to go. You know, having them out laid out for you versus having to get them in the drawer and pull them out is actually a huge, huge thing. I know some people, you know, sleep in their gym clothes so that all they have to do is hop out of bed and go to the gym um, all the, or put their shoes on and go to the gym. So, you know, little things like that, whether it's personal um, and things that you're trying to achieve at home or in work, I think uh, for all of us, you know, as business leaders um, and, and trying to have a positive impact on our colleagues and, and the people we work with, you know, most people don't fail to do something because they don't want to. It's because there's so many steps that they have to take to do the right thing. And this is where if you can eliminate those steps and just make it easy, you'll find that people will do this stuff because they they want to. We just make everything so hard. Um, so I'd love to hear, uh, to me, this, is, this is, is probably the most important one for me, right? I, I think we can wrap our head around a lot of these other things, but at the end of the day, if it is not easy, we're just not going to do it. So I'd love to hear some examples, you know, besides the um, getting gym clothes out or, or book next to the nightstand, you know, what what are you all doing to, to try to make some of these habits easy? I can share, Ben. Um, one of the things, my husband and I have a, like a couple group chat um, and what we do is we've been trying to do more bike riding and everybody will post or on this group chat, a screenshot of their Fitbit or whatever they did, however many miles they rode yeah, that day. Exactly. And a lot of them do it in the morning. And I'm like, oh, I didn't get out there this morning. So I'll throw it on, we have a Google calendar. Um, so after dinner, we go and we get that reminder, like, hey, at six o'clock, let's go take a bike ride, which helps to reinforce that idea to make it easy. And like, oh, let's do it. We've carved out 10 to 15 minutes. And then that accountability of, okay, let's send the screenshot into the group text. So everybody else, you know, that little motivation motivator like oh yeah we did it too like we're here um and that that's helped us yeah that's great and I think it, it, like you said the accountability aspect um having an accountability partner or or something that just you know helps helps it so that you don't fail <laughs> versus it you being you know by yourself trying to achieve things I think that that helps a lot um it's, it's hard to do, right? We, we don't want to embarrass ourselves. <laughs> Once you put it out in the world, it, you know, you're kind of on the line and, and that's the power of it, that it, it really kind of makes you um, take that extra step to, to try to do it. And, and that's, that's where, I'm uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark. Um, for me, this, this was like the most sort of resonated with me, this, this law or this rule um, and the accountability. I, I never really thought that up until the pandemic or even halfway through the pandemic that a 
sort of buddy system for helping me get into a better exercise habit would work. Cause I, I think I just sort of mentally blocked it out. It's just like, ah, it's not, I'm not going to do that. But a, a friend of mine and I have been walking in the morning. Um, we're, we started at two days a week. And now we're kind of the little steps at three days a week. Um, and I've even um, gone myself sometimes, um, but it's that accountability of kind of knowing that he's going to be there. Um, um, not relying on me. I guess he does rely on me a certain extent to be there, but that's for me that, I never thought that would work for me, but it's, it really has. Um, and it's, it's been pretty helpful, I guess, seven or eight months now I've been doing it. So it's been pretty helpful. That's great. It is, it is truly amazing. I, I, you know, I think that we all should, this is something that I think everyone struggles with. And I think we have to, and I think this, this probably even goes into the, the fourth law, the reward, right? We have to celebrate our successes. Um, because this is, it is a challenge. It is difficult to do these things. And yet at the end of the day, it, you know, even if it, it, it's starting small and you're building up, that is a huge, huge success. So I, I'd love to hear that. I mean, I think it's, um, I, I think at some point, and this, this goes into another thing that he talks about, you know, you, you make it easy. And then at some point, you're going to miss a day. And Mark, I don't know if you, know, if you come across those days where you just miss them. And one of the things he talks about is don't miss twice. It, it's hard. I mean, there was, so we, we meet at 6 a.m. at Benderson Park and um, he overslept a few weeks ago. And like, I got there and my immediate thought was to go home. Like when I realized he wasn't going to be there, you know? Like, it was like right away, like, I'm just going to go. Like, why would I walk? And I, I did. I didn't do as much, actually. But, um, yeah, I mean, that, to, to your point in the book, the excuse factor is, like, high. I, I don't know if other people are like that, but I certainly was like, ah, oh, Jay overslept. Why do I have to be here? So, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm actually reading another book, and they and one of the key concepts is the day after you missed doing whatever it was is always the hardest day to start. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It, it is, and it is the most important day to start. And, and that's what, you know, you think about the concept of, of com compound interest. The opposite of that is incredibly powerful as well. If you, if instead of improving 1% a day, if you decline 1% a day, you go to almost zero in within a year, right? It, it's the, the math behind it. it. We talk about this a lot when it comes to investing, right? If you have a 30% uh, loss, you have to uh, make a 50% gain to, to make it back, right? It's so much harder to come back from those declines. And so, yeah, I, I think those are the hardest days and the most important days, even if all it is is, Again, instead of maybe a long walk, if all it is is, you know what, I'm gonna walk around the block today because I wanna check the box and say, I did it today. It's hard, but I did it. I think that is incredibly powerful. Ben, what about in the professional world? I think we have we all become like task monkeys sometimes. And there's all these systems and there's all this artificial intelligence that's following us around and making our lives easier, but also like just constant interruptions. So in terms of like that, make it easy, I find that sometimes it's hard to find the right system. So again, just applying like the idea of that 1% improvement and the continuous improvement versus tackling the whole new system or that entire upgrade. It's hard to do that sometimes depending on what task monkey system you're using maybe. But I think that on, on the professional front, you have all these huge projects all the time. And so to maximize and make some of the important ones as easy as possible is really a wonderful takeaway. But I think in this world, in the pandemic, in this world that's going faster and faster, it's, it's hard to take a moment to look at doing it right and make it easiest because you just have to get it done. Can you talk to that for a second? You know, it, I will say this, this is something that I struggle with. And, and I don't know if, if this 100% ties in with, with your question, but 
what I think I struggle with myself is that a lot of times when I do something, I want to do it right. Right. I want to do it as well as I can. And at the end of the day, I think, especially when it comes to habits, is you don't have to be perfect. You, you have to be there. You have to show up. You have to make sure that you're giving the effort and that you're moving it forward versus not moving forward or worse, moving backward. And so a lot of times just showing up, not being perfect, but just making sure you don't fall behind is really important. And that's, I, I don't know about anyone else here. I mean, to me, that's, that's always a challenge because I, I want to do it right. I want to make it as good as possible. But this is where it ties back to those 1% improvements, right? If we just start, it doesn't have to be perfect when you start, but that gives you something to build on and to grow and to make 1% improvements so that two months from now, it may not be perfect then, but it's a lot better than where it was. And if you're waiting for perfection, it you're never going to get anywhere, right? We're, we're just not going to do it. And um, like I said, that's something I struggle with. Um, I'd love to hear, you know, anyone else's thoughts on that, because uh, I could learn a whole lot in that realm. That definitely resonates with me. And actually, when you're not perfect, that becomes an excuse <laughs> to all of a sudden let go after you've made progress sometimes. So um, Actually, I'm on target with my New Year's goal of losing weight uh, this year, and I credit this book for that because one of the things I did is make it about being a healthy person rather than just weight loss. And so he also talks about gaming um, as part of the reward. And so I set goals around being healthy, not just diet and exercise. So like I get five points I have five possible points every day, you know, that I could get. And if you get four out of five, that's still a win, even though one of them may not be working out or one of them may not be diet that day, you know? So it still keeps you moving forward and gives you a little bit of a cushion to keep that progress without feeling like you failed just because you weren't perfect that day. So Kat, I'd love to hear how the system that you use, how are you tracking? Because he, he talks a little bit about the habit tracking and, and the system he uses. I'd love to hear how you've done that point system. Yeah. So I set five things. So one is eating healthy. Um, one is getting any sort of workout in. One is walking my dog. We have a route that we follow every time. One is um, not drinking alcohol that day. And then one is waking up early because that seems to be a key factor in whether the day goes well or poorly. Um, and so I can get a point for each one of those. And if you get five out of five, that's awesome. But sometimes, you know, four out of five or three out of five, but it's still moving things forward. And I've accomplished things, even though I may not get all of them. That's great. And I'll, I'll show, um, here's, I'll share my screen again here. Um, this is, this is a, a template that, and, and I'll talk about this um, at the end as well, that, it, you know, on his website, he's got a lot of resources. Um, but uh, this is kind of what he put together, this habit tracker template. So no matter what it is, right, if you've got some habit that you're trying to do, and it, you could create this in Excel, and, and I have. Um, you know, you put your days, you circle the month that it is, you put your days, and then you just put a check next to it, right? It's a way to track and make sure that you are doing it. And by the end of the month, you see, you know what? I, I did a lot. And again, remember that unless you're really specific about it and, and um, you're, you're really trying to set a specific amount that you're doing, most of the time, this is just, did you do it or not, <laughs> right? Did you eat a little bit healthier that day? Did you exercise a little bit that day? Did you pick up the book and read a page that day? And then you check it off. And, and again, that's kind of our reward system that we look back and we can see that we've accomplished a lot through this. Um, so I'd love to hear if, if anyone has used something like this or 
um, like Kat, use some sort of um, point tracking system. I've used an app in the past. Um, I think it's probably still around. Um, I haven't used it recently, but it's called Strides, S-T-R-I-D-E-S. -E and you can set different um, different habits, good or bad, like you don't want to do this or you do want to do this either every day or every week or every month. And so if you're keeping any daily habits, you can just go on there at the end of the day or in the middle of the day and kind of click whether you've done them and get a little snapshot to see where you are and reminders on what you still need to do and things like that. So I think that if there's a lot of little habits um, you're trying to, to put into practice, that app might be something worth looking into. Yeah, thanks for sharing. It's amazing with technology these days. <laughs> there is there is so much that that is out there and um, that can help track and and keep us on on pace. Anyone else? This has to do a little bit with um, you know the the make it unsatisfying, but um, for me, uh, getting up in the morning, the only time that I'm going to have time to workout is going to be in the morning because by the time it gets to be seven o'clock and I get home, I'm just exhausted. Um, but committing, I've been doing Pilates and I, you know, if you sign up for the class and you don't show, they ding you 10 bucks, which, you know, 10 bucks doesn't sound like a lot. I mean, heck, that's a coffee, you know, that's a Starbucks and a cinnamon roll in the morning. But I have found like, for me, you know, making, if I don't sign up, like, I just, it's too easy to just not do it. And so, I follow through when I make it unsatisfying for myself, knowing that if I don't show up, my card's going to get dinged for $10 and it's, you know, maybe I'm motivated, you know, there's the carrot and the stick um, in this, I'm motivated by the stick to just get up and make it happen. And it's, it's crazy how, um, if I'm really motivated on Sunday night, I'll go and, and I'll sign up for a class, you know, five days, Monday through Friday. And on, on those weeks when I'm like, well, I've got some big meetings and, uh, you know, then I, I will pull one or two or even a goose egg like this week. I, you know, I think that it's a great transition into to the flip side of, of habits or how, you know, creating good habits. And uh, the flip side is how do you get rid of bad habits? Um, and, and, and I think that's almost as powerful. Um, and I think what you're talking about, Heather, it's, you know, reminds me of, of the swear jar, right? If, if you're going to swear, you need to put a dollar into the jar. And, and uh, it's things like that, that you make it so unattractive that you kind of learn through it. And, and so, you know, he goes through this concept of, of how to break a bad habit, right? First law, make it invisible, right? You, you don't want to see it. You don't want it to be in front of you. Second law, make it unattractive, you know, convince yourself that by doing something like that, you, these are all the bad things. This is how it, it's not good. Third law, make it difficult. Um, you know, it, the harder it is, you know, it, perfect example, right? If you sit after work, you sit down, you watch too much TV, you want to stop watching TV. Uh, you put the remote on the other side of the room. You take the batteries out of the remote. I've heard people that, you know, on so they're using social media too much. So what do they do? They delete the app from their phone. And if they're going to use it, they have to re-download it. And then they have to delete it at the end. And it really makes you think, do I really want to do that now? Or am I just bored and I'm, I'm trying to do something? Um, and the fourth law, you know, make it unsatisfying, right? So let's make it so that at the end of it, it doesn't feel good. And the hardest part, I think, is that, you know, bad habits feel good right away and they provide pain later on. Good habits don't feel good right away. It's pain right away, but they give you pleasure and, you know, create happiness down the road. And that is, that to me is the hardest thing that we struggle with. And, and these laws, when you do it in reverse, um, tries to to make it so that when you've got a bad habit it's painful up front um, versus something that that gives you some pleasure up front anyone else have uh, on the flip side any other 
uh, thoughts or feedback on things that habits that you've tried to kick and um, using some of these examples, how you've been able to do it. My worst and most frequent bad habit is my Diet Coke consumption. I'm an avid guy, Diet Coke drinker and have been for too many years. But um, so there are a lot of easy ways to make them a lot more difficult. But I also thought I would try to roadblock it with a good habit where sometimes I think it was so easy, especially this past year and you're working in isolation a lot of times, no one's even holding you accountable noticing how much often you get up and go to the fridge for Diet Coke anymore. So, um, but instead of, because I found so many times my reaction to a disappointment or my reaction to sitting down and trying to focus on something, I had this like terrible vice where I just needed it in my hand sometimes. So today I, grabbed water and a Diet Coke um, during this call. But, um, but instead of when my instinct is to get a Diet Coke, I've been trying to just do the Breathe app on my watch as at least a step in the right direction. It's not making it completely um, unaccessible, but it's a little bit of a roadblock and hopefully peppering it in some good habits with it. So I don't know how much of a combination that is, but I can't make it all the way unattractive and leave them all outside of the fridge because that is my end goal, but I just can't seem to bring myself to do it. Well, I think, you know, as we're, as we're approaching um, kind of the last, say eight minutes of this, um, you know, transitioning to this, I, I, I think that um, when we go through these big changes, these big habit changes, we expect that right away we're going to reap the benefits, right? You're putting all this time and effort into making the change. And so, um, you know, it, if your goal is, is to be a healthy person and now you're doing all these things to, to make it happen, you know, after a month of, of all that heartache, right, you wanna see the results. You wanna see that it, it is working and there's ways to track that to make sure you're having progress, but it never really works out exactly how we think it should. It's not this linear path that I'm putting all this work in, it's going to show success along the way how I would expect it. And this is, this is actually a concept that I shared with, with the Allegiant team, um, I think two years ago, in, which is, um, uh, I'll share my screen here. Um, it's this concept of the plateau of latent potential. <laughs> And this is where, you know, again, over time, you expect that you're going to see these results, which is that straight line, what you think should happen when you, you've been doing this for a little while. And it never actually is that way. Your results are always less than what you would expect until it gets to a point where, again, that, that compounding of returns starts to show off. And that's when the atomic habits really start to, to show their benefit. So I've always, I've talked about this with the team that um, he calls it the valley of disappointment. I, frankly, I forgot what he called it. And, and I started calling it the valley of despair because I, I just think that that's more, more in tune with kind of how we feel at, at some point. It's just, that's when people give up, right? That's when you, you've just had enough and you don't stick with it. Um, but you have to stick with it because over time, that's the only way you're going to benefit from, from these habits. Um, so for everyone here that's, that's trying to make some changes, and again, I will freely say I am no expert in this. I have a lot of work to do on this and I, I try it every day, but I try to remind myself that what I think should happen and really what does happen there's a disconnect there and I cannot let that um, bring me down. I cannot let that take my identity, identity away um, and I need to keep pushing forward. Um, so, so just know you're gonna have those roadblocks. And as we mentioned earlier, it comes down to how you rebound, 
you miss a day, what do you do that next day? Don't miss two in a row um, and try to keep moving forward. And I guess the last thing that I would say is that I don't know if anyone has gone to uh, James Clear's website. Um, I thought it was it, really good that at the end of the book, he has some bonus chapters that you can go to his website, you can download. It gives a little bit more detail of if you want to apply habits to business, here's some examples of how it works. If you want to apply it to uh, parenting, here's, here's how you can do that. So I think it gives you a little bit more idea of taking these four laws and applying it. So for anyone that hasn't, um, uh, hasn't gone to the website, I, I would, and, and look in the back of the book, it'll give you the actual links to some of those bonus uh, features. Um, and uh, he also has a newsletter that you can subscribe to. I subscribed a couple years ago. Um, I, was, I was thrilled that even recently, uh, one of those newsletters became very valuable and something I was working through with the client. And uh, so there, there is some nice tidbits that come out of that. But more importantly, I think it's just the, the reminder of the habits and, and that we need to keep moving forward with this. Um, and so I encourage everyone to, to go check out the website. Um, and other than that, I, I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for, for inviting me to lead this. I hope that everyone, if you need a, a few takeaways from this, uh, the first thing that I would say is, you know, whatever you're trying to do, don't just focus on, on the goal, focus on the system of how you're going to do it. Um, you know, make it your identity, make whatever it is you're trying to achieve your identity and do everything you possibly can um, to do that. And uh, last thing, you know, just start, start somewhere and then focus on continually improving and, and moving forward. And I can guarantee you if, if you do that, you're gonna be successful, um, but just get through the roadblocks, they will happen. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ben. That was really awesome. I know I speak personally, I always get motivated after these talks to kind of, I read the book um, probably about a year ago, I think back before the pandemic, but when I rethink about this, I always get just kind of re-motivated to kind of, hey, what can I do? And Jamie and Kat and some other ideas out here and Rhonda, um, fantastic. So Ben, thank you so much for putting your time out and, and sort of talking us through this book. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. Be on the lookout for more open book clubs for one in June. I think uh, that's it. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Great job, Ben. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Take care, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you.